Thank you. Well, if you would turn with me to Romans chapter 8, we're going to begin a new series now, just in this one chapter, six-part series in Romans chapter 8. Now, we sang for our first song this morning, Amazing Grace, and uh, there's that famous line, that saved a wretch like me. The word wretch means uh, a despicable or contemptible person. We sing some pretty bad things about ourselves on Sunday morning, don't we? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Now, I've, I've shared before uh, from a uh, dictionary entry 20 synonyms given for the word wretch. So I won't read them all to you, but just let me read a few to you. Uh, rascal, reprobate, good for nothing, scumbag, sleazeball. There's a good sampling for you there, okay? Um, this is, this is what we sang about ourselves this morning. That's what we're saved from, right? And understand that this word wretch is actually a biblical term, of course, there in, in, in our English Bibles. So if we just look back to Romans chapter 7, and we're going to spend a little bit of time there before we get to our main text this morning. Listen to Romans 7, 24. Paul says this, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death. Wretched man that I am. Well, our focus this morning is going to be on the answer to that question that follows. Who will deliver me from this body of death? There's a good answer to that question. But before we get to the answer, it's important that we see why he is asking this question in the first place. Why is he exclaiming what a wretched man he is? Why is he asking the question, who will deliver me from this body of death? We see in Romans chapter 7, right, because we, we, we have to understand the context of Romans chapter 8. So we see in Romans chapter 7 um, that this verse, verse 24 that I just read, it's, it's the climax of a very profound discussion on the law and sin. And essentially, here's what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 7. He's saying that the law itself is good. But when, it is, when it's applied to our sinful flesh, it only increases sin and ultimately brings death. Paul says very much the same in uh, chapter 5, verse 20 of Romans. He says the law came to increase the trespass, which sounds very counterintuitive, right? But this is really a theme throughout Romans and, and in many places uh, in Paul's letters. The law came to increase the trespass. This is what I call the red button syndrome. Like if you say to a child, whatever you do, do not push that red button. Do not push the red button. Well, what's, what's going to happen? That, that child is going to have, it's going to well within him to push the red button. And really, as we, we adults, we're not excluded from that. In fact, um, Paul is, is saying something very much like this in uh, Romans chapter 7. So let me read um, uh, a handful of verses here in Romans 7, beginning in verse 7. This is uh, basically this red button syndrome. For what shall we say then? That the law is sin? By no means. <clears throat> Yet if, I had not, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. And that's really profound, and that's really important for um, our text this morning. So, uh, I, won't, I won't read the rest of it, but, but from there on, Paul continues in this theme, talking about the law, basically this red button syndrome, how, how the law is good, but it actually uh, more or less stirs up sin within us. All right, if, if we look earlier in, in Romans chapter 7, he says that um, 
While we were living in, in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. So Paul continues in that theme in the latter part of Romans chapter 7, and that's when he comes to this climax, where he says, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? He says, Even the law, which is holy and good, it just makes me a worse sinner. What kind of hope do I have? That's the question he poses. And praise God, there is an answer to that question, and his name is Jesus. Verse 25, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that sentence is really what connects chapter 7 and chapter 8. And there's a sentence that follows that I would almost want to put that in parentheses. It's kind of a parenthetical comment that's summing up what he said there in Romans chapter 7. But, but, but that, that statement, thanks be to God. To God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That really connects us to verse 8, to, to chapter 8, because chapter 8, you see, is also all about Jesus. There is therefore now, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's how our text begins. And so begins our series in what has been called the greatest chapter in all of Scripture. This is a, a very wonderful chapter. So I would like you now to, to rise with me as, as we read our main text this morning. I know we've read uh, a little bit already, but uh, Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 1 through 4, is going to be our uh, focus this morning. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this wonderful passage and for all that follows here in, in Romans chapter 8. We thank you uh, that, that there is an answer to that question, who will deliver me from this body of death? We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the gospel. And we pray, Lord, that you'll help us to see it afresh this morning, uh, that you give us insight through your word, and, uh, and that your spirit would do its work in us. We pray in Jesus' name. So there are many wonderful promises in this chapter, and that's uh, probably why it's been called by many the greatest chapter in all of Scripture. So we're going to see some great promises as we go through the series. And the very first is, is this in, in verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's a really good promise, especially if you understand um, the, the, the situation that he lays out in Romans chapter 7. There is no condemnation. Imagine with me, you are in a courtroom. The judge is sitting at his bench. The judge is God himself. The prosecutor is Satan. And there's a slideshow going on there in the courtroom. A hundred frames per second of every evil thought and deed that you have had, that you've committed. It's an open and shut case. It's a pretty sobering thing to think about, isn't it? But then, walks, then in walks Jesus, your court-appointed defense. And by the way, this is all biblical imagery, right? Satan's the accuser. Jesus is our advocate. We see that in Scripture. And God is the judge. He's the righteous judge of all the universe. So in walks Jesus, your court-appointed defense. He hands the judge, God the Father, he hands him a paper. And now it's time for the verdict. So he has the defendant rise. So you rise with Jesus at your side. And here's the verdict. After this, 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 this slideshow, it's an open and shut case, right? You've seen it right there before your eyes. But the verdict is not guilty. Not guilty. Because you see that paper that Jesus gave to the judge. It has this very passage written on it. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's powerful. As we dive into this text, uh, we're going to look at it according to two competing laws, because that's, that's what uh, Paul gives us here. Two competing laws. Uh, go ahead and look at verse 2 with me. He says, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. 
So you see those two competing laws, and the word law is used loosely here. Uh, we're going to talk about exactly what this means. Uh, but he says, the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So we have two competing laws there. We're going to address them in reverse order because really that, that final one there, the law of sin and death, that's where we all begin. That's what we all need to be freed from. And so first, let's just talk about the law of sin and death. What is the law of sin and death? What is this law that we need to be freed from by the spirit of life? The law of the spirit of life. Well, if we just read on, uh, we see. Plus, uh, you're going to see how Romans 7 gives us some key information that we need. But if we, if we just read on to verse 3, it says, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. Let's just pause there for a moment. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. So what is the law of sin and death? I think we see here that the law of sin and death is the law weakened by the flesh. It's not the law itself, because we, we saw in Romans 7 that the law is good, right? God's law is holy and good and righteous. But the law weakened by the flesh, it's going to bring about sin and death. And that's why it is called the law of sin and death. We see that the law of sin and death is when God's holy and perfect law bumps up against our sinful flesh. And thereby produces even more sin, and ultimately, death. Again, Romans 7 is exactly what we see. Now, this might look different um, depending on a person's, uh, depending on a person or the circumstance. Um, whenever the law bumps up against your sinful flesh or, or the sinful flesh of another person, it might look like just open rebellion, right? Some, some people, they hear the law of God, and in their flesh, they say, no, I don't want any part of that, right? And so there's just maybe an open rebellion. But for some, it might be more of, of like a hidden hypocrisy. And that's really, it seems to be, that, that must have been the case with Paul, because remember, Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was all about keeping the law. He, he said that he loved the law, right? This is, that is b b before um, his conversion, uh, before he was... Uh, before that encounter with the risen Jesus on the Damascus Road. But even, but even after that encounter, there's still a struggle that, that, that Paul um, lays out in Romans 7. And, and uh, there's, there's, a, there's a lot there that we won't be able to discuss this morning. But um, suffice it to say that, yeah, Paul, Paul, for Paul, it was, it was probably more of this hidden hypocrisy, right? So, so, so the law, uh, I mean, think about the Pharisees in, in, uh, in Jesus' ministry. Um, the law that they thought was, was what made them holy, but, but it, it actually is what ended up giving them uh, so much pride. And uh, it, it, was, it was their demise because they thought they were keeping the law because they, they were keeping it on a surface level. But one of the things Jesus came to show is that, oh, no, it's so much deeper than you realize. And, and therefore, we all stand condemned because of the law. Even the Pharisee who thinks that he has acquired righteousness through the law. So, so whatever the case, whether, whether it's just open rebellion or some kind of hidden hypocrisy, uh, and the hidden hypocrisy, yes, it might involve some kind of pride, thinking you're keeping the law, or it might just involve secret sins, right, where you put on a front to everybody else. And so you know that, that, that you are uh, headlong into this or that sin, but maybe nobody else knows about it. Um, there's, there's kind of a continuum, maybe, between this, this open rebellion and this um, hidden hypocrisy. But, but Paul, Paul is making clear that apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ, the law is not going to do you any good, that it's going to bring about sin and death. Only the gospel can save us from the law of sin and death. And only the gospel can bring about true holiness and life. Right? So, so it's, it's, not that we're, it's not that we're discarding holiness when we're talking about the law of sin and death. We're just saying that... that, that that holiness does not come through the law apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. That, that, that we, we've, got to, we've got to focus in on the gospel, and that's what the law points us to. I'm getting ahead of myself here, but the law points us to the gospel. It points us to our need for Jesus. And then when we recognize that, when we embrace the gospel, then we can have true holiness and true life. So only the gospel can save us from the law of sin and death. Let's read verse 3 in full. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. So what did God do? Uh, so, so the law, weakened by the flesh, it can't accomplish 
holiness and life. But God, he accomplished it. What did he do? By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So we see here uh, the gospel in a nutshell, right? Uh, the law weakened by the flesh, it's not, going, it's not going to do. We need Jesus. We need the gospel. And so Jesus came and he condemned sin in the flesh. Isn't it interesting how Paul uses that word? Because we see that, why is there therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? Because Jesus condemned sin. We are not condemned because Jesus came and he condemned sin in the flesh. So we've got to fix our eyes upon Jesus. In Romans 7, um, Paul gives this example of the law, do not covet, right? He says, essentially, that the law, do not covet, or, you know, you pick, is not going to do you any good apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Again, it is meant to point us to our need for the gospel. And that's, that, that's something essential that you need to see this morning, that uh, that, that, that is... If the law does not point you to your need for Jesus, then it's not going to do you any good. So let's just pause and think about that for a moment. Does the law do that for you? Does when 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 you meditate on God's law, which we should, right? Um, think about Psalm chapter one. On on your law I meditate day and night. Right? We should. We should love and cherish God's law. Now, we are in the New Covenant, and so there's some implications there uh, that we'll, we'll touch on a little bit. But, but we're just talking about, for now, God's, God's unchanging moral law, right? True holiness. We, we, we should want to be holy, and, 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 we, and we should savor God's instruction on how we can be holy, But it's got to first point us to our need for the gospel of Jesus Christ for any kind of holiness to be accomplished. So think about it. When, when you think about the law, um, if you just see it as, as some practical guidance or just a goal to be reached, even, even a goal for godliness, if you see that apart from the, from the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, it's only going to bring about sin and death. Because, because it, it, it is a, your sinful flesh is um, you know you have like a chemical reaction. I right? think about if, if you mix if you mix uh, vinegar and baking soda, you got that. You know you, you all did the volcano when you were kids, right? right? That, that's what happens when the law comes together with our sinful flesh apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so you might have good intentions. You say, oh, I want to be holy. I want to love God. And so so I'm, I'm going to. But but if it doesn't if, if it doesn't show you your sin, then there's a problem, right? Maybe you're a Pharisee. You think you're keeping the law. Um, but, but Jesus, again, he came to show that, oh, it's so much deeper than you realize. There's no way we can keep God's law on our own. And then, of course, even, even as people redeemed by the blood of Jesus, uh, born-again believers, it's, it's a process that we go through throughout this life, and then we're not going to reach perfection until Christ returns and, and uh, uh, raises us from the dead and, and, and uh, perfects us in both body and soul. All right, so um, you got to think about it. What, what does the law do for you when, when you look at it? Um, it must bring about a, a uh, desperation, right? That's, that, that, that's, that's what Paul is saying here. We, we've got to see how desperately we need the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, so... Um, Jesus condemned sin in the flesh, and in doing so, we are set free from the law of sin and death by the law of the spirit of life. So let's look at this next point, the law of the spirit of life. So jumping back to verse 2 again, the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So what is the law of the spirit of life? Well, first notice these words, in Christ Jesus. It's all about Jesus, right? That's what we have to get first. And so essentially we see that the law of the spirit of life is, it's the gospel. So it's what we've been talking about, right? Um, we, we, we have to see our great need for the gospel, and that's what the law is intended to point us toward. 
So um, we might say that the law of the spirit of life is relying on Jesus' fulfillment of the law, his death in our place, and his spirit given to us. Relying on Jesus' fulfillment of the law, his death in our place, and his spirit given to us. And that is what frees us from the law of sin and death. I'm going to read in a, an excerpt here from um, Pilgrim's Progress. Now, I actually read this in uh, my podcast uh, a few weeks ago. So for the, um, I, there's probably not many of you that even listen to it anyway. But if, if, if and I'm, I'm not groveling, but um, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying bear with me if, if, if you've heard this before. But, but I've, uh, I've got to include this because it's, it's so, uh, so helpful. So, in Pilgrim's Progress is a story of a guy named Christian, um, who is, he's traveling from the city of destruction to the celestial city. It's all an allegory of, of, of the Christian life, of, of our journey to, um, uh, to, to the kingdom of God, to, to heaven. And, uh, and so along, along the way, he comes to uh, the house of the interpreter. And so at the house of the interpreter, he learns some, some key lessons for the Christian life. And so, uh, just let me pick up there. At the house of the interpreter, um, he is led into a very large parlor that was full of dust. When they had observed it for a moment, the interpreter called for a man to sweep it. When he began to sweep, the dust rose and filled the whole room so that Christian almost suffocated. The interpreter said to a maid who stood by, bring water and sprinkle the room, which he did. And then the dust settled and the maid swept the room clean. Christian asks, what does this signify? The interpreter responds, this parlor is the heart of man that has never been sanctified and cleansed by the grace of God through the gospel. The dust is his original sin and corruption that have defiled the whole man. The man who began to sweep at first is the law. Remember we read uh, in Romans 7 about um, these passions are roused by the law. You see the connection here? Um, the man who began to sweep first is the law. The maid who brought the water and finished the job is the gospel. The man, though working with all his might, could not clean the room. He only stirred up the dust and made it worse to live in. This shows you that the law, by its working, instead of cleansing the heart from sin, only revives it, causes sin to show its strength, and increases its activity in the soul. Though it discovers and forbids sin, it does not give the life and power to subdue it. So man cannot of himself give up his sin without first receiving the divine life and help from above. This is why the maid came and sprinkled the room with water and, clean, and, and cleaned it with all ease. To show you that when the gospel of Christ comes to the heart with all sweet and gracious influence, new life comes in. Sin is subdued and vanquished and the soul is made clean by simple faith in Christ. Consequently, man is made fit for the habitation of the king of glory. I think that's a really, really helpful picture. And of course, it is very much like what Paul is saying there in Romans chapter 7. Uh, we need the gospel. And, and, and notice, um, that's what brings about true holiness. Sin is subdued and vanquished, not by the law, but then when the gospel comes into our lives and... And, and changes us from the inside out. Verses 3 and 4 now. Let's look back at our text. So let's reread this. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So here's a key question. Um, how is the righteous requirement of the law fulfilled in us? Right? It says, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Well, it's not picking up yourself by your own bootstraps. That is the law of sin and death. Rather, it is the law of the spirit of life that fulfills the righteous requirement of the law within us. And so if we just back up to the end of verse 3, again, we see this um, gospel in a nutshell, right? By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemns sin in the flesh. And that's what accomplishes the 
the righteous requirement of the law within us, the fulfillment of the righteous requirement of the law. So how do you fulfill the righteous requirement of the law? It's not just by picking up yourself, it's not just picking yourself up by your own bootstraps and saying, I'm going to do it uh, because you can't. And the fact that you can't is what should point you to your need for Jesus. And that's where we experience true change, true holiness, and true life. Quick comment here on this phrase in the likeness of sinful flesh. Does Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh? Does that mean that Jesus sinned? Well, of course not. We see in Scripture that Jesus never sinned. And in fact, if he had sinned, then sin would not have been condemned. So when it says that Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh, it's just simply saying that he took on human flesh in its fallen state. And we know this because you know, Jesus suffered and died, right? He experienced the kinds of things that we all experience. He, he took on the likeness of sinful flesh. And it's because of that that the author of Hebrews can say in Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect, in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So the good news of the gospel is that Jesus lived a perfect life of obedience. Right? He was without sin. He fulfilled the law in living a perfect life of obedience. And then he died for our sin. Right? This is what, uh, what we call the great exchange. Jesus, he takes our sin upon himself on the cross and he gives us his righteousness. And that is how the righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in us. And so this speaks to our justification, right? We talk about this often. Justification is, is whenever you are made right before God, whenever you are saved, right? Whenever you trust in Jesus and your sins are forgiven, when God looks upon you, he doesn't see that, that 100 frames per second um, slideshow of sin, but instead he sees Jesus, your advocate. And, and not only that, but you are clothed in the righteousness of Christ if you have been saved, if you have been justified. And so that, that's a passive thing, right? That we don't do that. God does that. Right? It has been fulfilled. Uh, the, 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 the verbiage here is, is passive. In order that the righteous, righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. But the verse doesn't stay passive. In verse 4 it says, it continues at the, at the end of verse 4. Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So there's, there's uh, an active sense here as well. So this, is, this speaks to our sanctification, right? So, so we are justified, but that's just the beginning. Right? Then, then throughout our Christian lives, we are going through this process of sanctification. We're, we're being conformed to the image of Christ. And, and yes, it is a supernatural thing, but it's also something that, that we join in, that we, that we must be active in, in, in fighting sin and in pursuing holiness. Um, you know, even though we are no longer under the Mosaic law, we still have moral obligations, right? Uh, that's, that's made clear in the New Testament. To be conformed to the image of Christ is to love God and love neighbor as Jesus did. It's to follow Jesus' commands. It's to, to follow the commands that we see throughout the New Covenant, which, 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 which tell us how it is that we ought to love God and to love neighbor. And so um, we pursue holiness, uh, but it's, it's, on, it's on the tail end of, of uh, seeing our desperate need for Jesus, right? We've, we've got to have it on the tail end rather than thinking that it's something we can do on our own. Let me close with this. Um, notice at the end of verse 4, it's really just an assumption that such a person, the person who is in Christ Jesus, right? There's therefore no, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So that's who Paul's talking about, those who are in Christ. And it's just an assumption that he makes that, that, that these people are those who are walking by the Spirit. Walking according to the Spirit. And as we, as we move on in, in this um, chapter, in the coming weeks, we're going to see that there's a stark contrast made between those who walk according to the flesh and those who walk according to the Spirit. Those who walk according to the flesh are, are not saved. Those who walk according to the Spirit are we see that clear contrast, okay? So this is a matter of being lost and saved. But for those who are indeed saved, those who, have, if you have the Spirit of Christ within you, um, of course, we all, we all are um, at different places in our journey, and, and, and we often um, stagger and stumble and fall, and um, some of us more than others, and some of us are more diligent in pursuing Christ 
than others. And so I would ask you, um, maybe, maybe you really have been delivered from the law of sin and death. Maybe you really are born again, but, but how is your stride? This it says we walk not according to the flesh, but to the spirit. Maybe, maybe you, uh, you do have the spirit of God, but uh, you're walking as if you still have shackles on your feet. You've been delivered from the law of sin and death, but you kind of have this muscle memory thing going on, right? Where, where the shackles aren't there, but you're kind of walking as if they are. Again, we, we all have different tendencies. We have different styles of, of sinning, uh, that open rebellion versus the hidden hypocrisy. Think about the, the prodigal son versus the older brother. Uh, the prodigal son, he, he is, he's extravagant and, 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 and open with his sin. The, the older brother, he's full of pride and obstinance. Um, we might tend one way or the other. But, uh, but, but if, 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 you're, if you're living in that kind of sin, you're living according to the law of sin and death. So here's the solution. Uh, well, first of all, um, for those of you who are truly enslaved by the law of sin and death, you need to come to Jesus maybe for the first time and, and, and just see your desperate need for him and acknowledge that and, and place your faith in him and say, I can't, I, 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 I can't do it on my own. But, uh, but again, for maybe those of you, those of us who, um, who are born again, but you know, we, we struggle. Here's a solution. Here's a solution to um, truly walking according to the Spirit. If you want to have true holiness, if you want to have life to the full, the gospel, it can't just simply be an afterthought. It can't just be an afterthought. And, and, and I fear that uh, for, for so many people, uh, in our church, uh, but I mean in churches uh, throughout this nation, throughout the world, but I'd say especially in our nation, um, that, that's, that oftentimes the gospel is just kind of an afterthought. Right? So, so yes, you, know, you believe all the right things, and maybe you have been born again. You know, there's, there's maybe some ambiguity there, because right? if there's not a whole lot of fruit, then you know, that's, uh, that's something that uh, maybe only God knows. But, uh, but, but there, there are a lot of people who... Um, believe the right things and, and, and perhaps really are born again, but uh, they're, just, they're just not living in the freedom that, uh, that the gospel has purchased for us. There are a lot of things that threaten to displace um, the gospel's uh, rightful position in our lives. So remember I said the solution, the solution to um, let me say to this, if, if you want to have true holiness and life to the gospel, if you want to have true holiness and life to the full, then the gospel simply cannot be an afterthought. So here are a few things that um, might displace the gospel from its rightful place. Judeo-Christian values. It's a good thing, but Judeo-Christian values won't do. Do not let Judeo-Christian values displace the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't let God and country displace the gospel of Jesus Christ. God and country won't do. Some kind of generic religiosity, you know, praying to the man upstairs, that won't do. Pop Christianity, cultural Christianity, it won't do. Just some kind of personal spirituality right, that's kind of in vogue today, that won't do. We have to have the gospel of Jesus Christ front and center. It must be the driving force of our lives. Which means that we have to keep it central. We have to wholly rely upon Jesus' fulfillment of the law, his death in our place, and the spirit given to us. And we walk according to that spirit. And so that is the law of the spirit of life. And we see in this uh, passage, the law of the spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. We're going to transition now to the Lord's Supper. And we're going to celebrate the, um, our freedom from the law of sin and death. Uh, that is been given to us by the law of the spirit of life. So those who are serving, go ahead and come forward. And, and uh, as, as you uh, are coming forward to um, prepare the elements, uh, I want to ask you uh, here this morning to prepare your heart.